welcome to DPLA Fest 2013. I'm Dan Cohen. I'm emceeing tonight because I'm the executive director of the Digital Public Library of America. Um, but I first, I, we've got a lot of uh, exciting announcements tonight. Um, we'll have a set of brief talks and, and, uh, and some announcements at the end. But I wanted to start off by introducing Amy Ryan, president of the Boston Public Library. walks of life from public libraries, academic libraries, private industries, philanthropies. I've been in libraries a long time, and I think this is truly a unique event to see so many people interested in access to information in the Digital Public Library of America. I think the important thing that we have seen so much activity in digitization and thanks to more of Marx's vision and Tom Blake's persistent leadership, the Boston Public Library has been digitizing photos, prints, maps, manuscripts since 2005. And now more than ever, as we reach out to communities across Massachusetts as the BPL and DPLA does across the country, we really are seeing the human story of it. Whether it's people looking at small town yearbooks, or curious thinkers accessing scholarly manuscripts. It really is, for a librarian and for all of us, a powerful statement about the Digital Public Library of America. So we are honored to be part of this library frontier. We were leaders in the 18th century, and we're proud to be among you as leaders in the 21st century as we really pioneer and push the edges of access to information and free to all. So I hope you enjoy the evening. I'm glad you're all at, at, in Boston and at the Boston Public Library. Thank you, Dan. Thanks, Amy. Thanks very much, Amy. Um, so welcome to DPLA Fest, a uh, two-day event. It's really um, run by you. Um, it is going to be an exciting volunteer effort. We had over 700 people sign up to participate. and. Um, I just want to first thank Amy so much for hosting here tonight, um, for her leadership, and for, in fact, giving us a home. DPLA is, in fact, um, in the building next door, upstairs. Um, and it's really special. I think the staff comes in here every morning, and it's wonderful to be right here um, in the first municipal public library um, as a digital library, to have a home here, uh, a very special thing. Um, in the aftermath of the, the April tragedy, I wrote a note to the DPLA community um, that ended with this message. Um, I see the building of a new library as one of the greatest examples of what humans can do together to extend the light against the darkness. In due time, we will let that light shine through. And we're here tonight, and that light is shining through. Um, we are so excited to let you know about our progress, what's happened over the first six months of this project, and to participate along with the DPLA community in building more and building more for the future. So we are in full swing operationally. We actually have staff here. There, there's some uh, 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 staff throughout. They have special blue name tags. Um, so you will see them uh, as you go through the next couple of days. And um, we started out with 2.4 million items six months ago. And as of yesterday at noon, we more than doubled to 5 million. We have just surpassed the 5 million point. For 88,000 over 5 million. Um, and this is a really exciting milestone for us. We've also received tremendous accolades, even in this infancy. Um, Time Magazine named us one of the best websites of 2013. That's, up, that's us in the upper left. We even get the poll position there. And we were named um, one of the best uh, uh, teaching and learning websites from the American Association of School Libraries. But beyond these numbers, um, and we're excited about that, and indeed, we have the word digital as the first uh, word in our title, Digital Public Library of America. Despite that, um, really, I think there's a poorly kept secret about the DPLA, and that is that uh, DPLA is people. We are people, um, not just the staff, but really the thousands of people who participated in the planning stage, who really are responsible for us being here tonight. We had so many people 
help us out along the way, participate in planning uh, and, and the plenaries across the country. We had over 1,000 people at those plenaries. We have over 2,000 people on our mailing list. Those are people who have contributed, Americans, people from around the world as well, who have contributed to this effort. I want to thank them, and I want to thank some groups um, in general who have been so instrumental. Um, first of all, the DPLA board, nine really critical members who have given their all to support our effort and to be a, a central part of our planning and execution and governance now in this next phase. There was also a steering committee of a larger group of people. I'm sorry I don't have time to name everyone. We're trying to keep it relatively brief, but we had a larger group of, of a steering committee that was really instrumental over the past three years in the planning phase uh, as well. And we even had, beyond that, larger groups of committees in work streams on different topics ranging from legal to content to technical um, and other uh, really critical areas of endeavor that have helped us out. And those people, again, labored intensely over the last three years to get us to this point. We also wouldn't be here without um, the, the hubs. Um, as those of you um, who are familiar with the DPLA will know, we are really an aggregation of content from hubs, both service hubs, which aggregate from state and regional uh, areas, and also content hubs, big institutions that are donating um, uh, time, labor, and content to the DPLA. Um, so those hubs have really been critical to what we're doing, and um, I want to thank them all for their efforts. And uh, over the next day, you will see that they also are especially indicated by a, a big gold star on their badge. So if you see a hubs member, you can give them a fist bump. Yeah, all right. Hug, hug a hubs. All right, that's uh, a great thing. Um, I also want to thank our co-hosts for uh, DPLA Fest 2013, Boston Public Library, of course, um, as well as the, the two um, institutions that are hosting tomorrow's events, uh, Northeastern University's College of Social Sciences and Humanities generously provided so much space and, and people and effort to bring this together. And the same is true for the Simmons College Graduate School of Library and Information Science. Um, I want to thank them for, for all that. I also want to thank the Berkman Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University that really played a key role as the, the home of all this planning, the secretariat, um, planning the plenaries. Planning this event came out of Berkman, and I can't thank those uh, Berkmanians uh, enough for their mania um, and for their work uh, for DPLA. Finally, we also really wouldn't be here without um, the resources to fulfill the incredibly ambitious idea that is the Digital Public Library of America. We had such leadership uh, from Doran Weber and the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, Doran is about to speak, um, who really gave a, a really instrumental early grant and indeed now a grant to DPLA Inc., our independent 501c3 organization, to get us up and running. Um, we really thank them for their leadership and their generosity. That generosity was matched by critical additional funding by the Arcadia Fund, the Knight Foundation, the Institute of Museum and Library Services, and the National Endowment for the Humanities, as well as this summer an anonymous donor who stepped forward to give $450,000 to support our mission, and really believed in our mission of open access to America's collections for all globally. Um, so I want to thank our funders again. It's so critical to get the resources to be able to execute on an idea, a really audacious idea like the DPLA. So let me introduce, thank you. Yes, a round of applause for our funders. So let me pass the mic to Dorn and who will talk about his vision. Thanks, Dan. Hi, everybody. Um, well, on behalf of the Sloan Foundation, it's great to be here today to celebrate the DPLA's successful launch six months ago and to take stock of how much has been accomplished since, as well as how much still needs to be done. Thank you to our host, Amy Ryan, and the Boston Public Library, the first large library open to the public in the US and the first public library to allow people to borrow books and other materials and take them home to read and use. I learned this from Wikipedia. Um, <laughs> Also, you might guess I'm a Yankees fan because it's the also the second largest. <laughs> it's the the I want to say something nice. <laughs> Boston, 
it's it's the second <laughs> it's the second largest. You guys are, are kicking our butt this year. Come on, this the second largest public library in the United States, the Boston Public Library. So we're very honored to be here. Although we have exciting announcements today, and though tomorrow is all about the future of DPLA, I'm going to indulge in a little retrospection and flag waving. Maybe it's being in the cradle of the American Revolution or just looking at my fellow speakers, all hardy veterans of the same struggle. Bob and John and Moore and many others are not up here, but I feel we are an ancestral cross between the founding fathers and the foot soldiers of the DPLA Revolution. Call us the founding foot soldiers. I can't believe we actually made it to this day where the DPLA, like a new nation, has been born and is functioning on a daily basis. It's a proud moment for dreamers and revolutionaries and progressives that against all odds, this great nonprofit digital library network that aims to contain the full breadth of human expression and keep it open and accessible and searchable by everyone, a digital library system by the people, for the people, and of the people is now in existence. Many decades in the visioning, two and a half years in the planning with a small steering committee and, incredible, and an incubation hub at the helm, and fe featuring dozens of great libraries, universities, and archives, involved in hundreds of meetings, workshops, and hackathons, attracting thousands of volunteers backed by millions of foundation and government dollars, the Digital Public Library of America was a utopian dream that finally made it into functional beta stage reality in April 2013. It's resulted from the efforts of many individuals and institutions, several of which you'll hear from today. Speaking for just one of those organizations, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, we are proud to have supported the DPLA vision even before there was a DPLA. I wish to thank the Sloan Board of Trustees and Sloan President Paul Josko for having the prescience and conviction to let us become the lead funders of the early stage effort and to have backed it at every turn with millions of dollars so we could help DPLA reach its launch and begin to operate. Since 2004, Sloan's program in universal access to knowledge has been committed to using advances in digital information technology to make the fruits of scientific and cultural knowledge available to all under the highest standards and values. Sloan made early grants to the Library of Congress, the Internet Archive, Wikipedia, the Boston Library Consortium, Lyricists, and the Medical Heritage Library to further this vision. Our support for the DPLA started with a small seed grant of $36,388 to Radcliffe in October 2010 to hold a two-day conference on creating a national digital library. That conference was hosted by Robert Darnton, that great scholar and eloquent champion. Where are you, Bob? Is that you over there? Hi, Bob. Um, with a planning committee of John Palfrey, Moore Marx, Carl Malamud, um, and actually, and myself, was attended by 40 leaders from libraries, archives, cultural institutions, government agencies, and foundations. It led to the start of the DPLA and its one-sentence founding charter that remains valid to this day. I recall standing by whiteboard in front of that room and composing that sentence word by word with editing and input from every member until we had one single sentence we could all agree on. We said the DPLA would be an open, distributed network of comprehensive online resources that would draw on the nation's living heritage from libraries, universities, archives, and museums to educate, inform, and empower everyone in the current and future generations. Future revolutionaries take note. That was the seed, the one hard kernel we needed. Immediately after that meeting, Sloan approved a $125,000 grant to the Berkman Center at Harvard to develop the Digital Public Library of America through a series of workshops and meetings. By December 2010, DPLA had established uh, a secretariat based at Harvard's Berkman Center assembled a steering committee of distinguished leaders with John Palfrey as chair. John's skillful leadership has been key throughout and remains to this day. And later myself as vice chair and created six work streams, a website, a wiki, and a discussion listserv. By March of 2011, DPLA held its first work stream meeting. In April, DPLA received additional support from the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Open Society Institutes, and in May we held a meeting in Amsterdam, including cooperation with Europeana. In June, Sloan approved the $836,000 grant to the Berkeley Law Center to support DPLA's legal work stream by developing solutions to copyright obstacles facing public library efforts. In October 2011, the DPLA planning phase was officially launched at a Washington, D.C. plenary hosted by the National Archives and our good friend David Ferry. I don't know, is David here tonight? No, okay. Hi, David. 
Thank you, David. The Sloan Foundation announced a $2.5 million grant for an intensive two-year process of workshops, meetings, plenaries, research, pilot digitization, prototype development, and community building that would result in the launch of the Digital Public Library of America. The Arcadia Fund, anyone from Arcadia? No. Okay, Peter. Um, uh, very generously matched our $2.5 million, and the process that led to this great day was underway. Finally, in December of 2012, after the Digital Hubs pilot began with support from Knight, uh, the Knight Foundation, the NEH, and the Institute of Museum and Library Services, um, Sloan approved a $1.2 million grant to DPLA Inc., the first official grant to this newly incorporated entity, to launch DPLA as an independent national organization and to hire an executive director and two key staff and to scale up. After an intensive process, we successfully recruited the outstanding, impressive, and remarkable Dan Cohn. Uh, I'm coming to the end. Dan took over in March 2013 with major contributions at hand from Harvard University, the Smithsonian, the New York Public Library, Art Store, the National Archives, University of Virginia, University of Illinois, and the Biodiversity Heritage Library. The DPLA went live in April 2013, and within one month, as um, Dan just showed you, it was named one of the 50 best websites by Time and best web website for teaching and learning by the American Association of School Librarians. Today, DPLA can be thought of in terms of three Ps, a portal, a platform, and a principle. Uh, as a portal, DPLA offers a, an entree that allows students, teachers, and scholars innovative ways to search and scan through unified collections of millions of items. Since April, and again, as Dan just showed, DPLA, with a huge thanks to the Hathi Trust, has doubled its holdings from 2.4 million items to over 5 million items, and increased the number of contributing institutions from 600 to over 1,100. Over 18 service hubs and content hubs are now partnering with DPLA and have contributed millions of records for the DPLA repository. But we need exponentially more content, more diverse content, content from more contributors, and more diverse forms of content. And we need to improve the thorny rights environment, including the rights statements governing reuse of our materials and the need to maintain openness. The DPLA also offers a platform that enables new and transformative uses of our digital digitized cultural heritage. An open API and maximally open data gives access to metadata drawn from the DPLA's service and content hubs and allows software developers, researchers, and others to, cr to create novel learning and discovery environments and engaging apps. Over 1.7 million users came through the API in the last month, meaning they accessed DPLA material without ever coming to our site, proof of the robustness of this technology and the wisdom of this strategy and our thanks to um, a number of the developers who I saw here tonight. Uh, can some of them raise their hands? Yeah, okay. Uh, it was an incredible team. Um, but we seek even more use from a wider array of people in more parts of the country, from amateur enthusiasts and the general public to students and teachers. One huge growth area is to get DPLA content into classrooms from K-12 to college and graduate schools. Another is to leverage our interest in grassroots commitments. Our service hubs are state and regional digital libraries that serve as on-ramps for material from local libraries, archives, and historic societies and community museums. Now through the enterprising Dan Cohen and his DPLA st the DPLA staff, DPLA has made a bid for FCC funds to modernize the E-rate infrastructure program for schools and libraries by offering up to 17,000 local libraries new forward-looking services, including serving up our content by repurposing our open platform and common cloud architecture to achieve their educational mission. Good luck to Dan and that bid and to DPLA. That would be a game changer for us. Finally, in addition to being a unique portal and an innovative platform, DPLA is a principle, the principle that all who desire to learn or be informed should have unfettered access to knowledge. Public libraries have long provided access to material for free and DPLA is committed to maintaining open access and usability in the face of restrictive digital options. We also, we're also committed to global connectivity and interoperability, as evidenced by our partnering with Europeana. The birth of DPLA is good news for students and teachers and scholars and anyone anywhere who cares about education, knowledge, or is seeking information of any kind. But of course, today's DPLA is only a prototype, a young nation still defining itself and growing up. We still have a Louisiana purchase or two ahead of us, 
and we must avoid secession and civil war and autocracy while becoming a true democracy serving a diverse citizenry and providing, if not a chicken in every pot, at least a public library with a well-curated digital access in every town. So much work and many challenges remain. Sloan is proud of its founding role, and we proudly salute our major DPLA foundation partners. But no single foundation or funding source can do this alone. DPLA will announce a new foundation partner today and is in discussions with several large new potential funders, and it calls on the foundation community, as well as private industry and government at all levels, to join us in this great historical undertaking for a national digital library network that supports all libraries and is open and collaborative and provides an unprecedented on-ramp for all scientific and cultural knowledge in every form from every corner of America. It's great to be here today and to be part of this great movement. Thank you. Thanks so much, Doran. And I, I promise not to rule with an iron fist in DPLA land. Um, next up is Robert Darton, professor and university librarian at Harvard University. I've been asked to make a few remarks about the origins and the general character of the DPLA. Uh, my answer, you know, people say, where did it all begin? Who thought it up? And my answer is, it's collective. It's cooperative. I think it was a collective response to a collectively felt need. But of course, there was a time and a place where it did get its start on October 1st, 2010. About 40 people met at Harvard and the Radcliffe uh, Institute to discuss, well, something that was a kind of far out idea. Shouldn't we create a digital public library for everyone free of charge? Well. Within the first few minutes, these 40 people, a collection of leaders of libraries, of foundations, including Doran, of a scattering of academics, everyone agreed it was a good idea and we would make it happen. After that, uh, the general notion was, let's create a coalition of foundations to provide the funding, a coalition of libraries, to provide the books, and then things got complicated. The first problem was how to express in words what our general goals were. And I remember Doran standing with a felt, blue felt marker. I thought it was a piece, a large piece of paper, but you said it was a whiteboard. Anyhow, there he was standing as we shouted ideas at him. And I'm a great believer in the inability of committees to draft anything, but somehow out of this meeting came something which is still our mission statement and which Doran just read to you. Then things got more complicated because we had to get organized. I won't go into all the details, but my point is here too, it was a collective enterprise. There were hundreds, there were thousands of people involved. We had uh, a steering committee, we had a secretariat, we had a sort of wisdom of the crowd at the Berkman Center, which was great, but there were six work streams scattered across the country. We had open meetings because a principle of openness, of transparency has animated the DPLA from the beginning. And so what happened as everywhere in the country, volunteers set to work was a wonderful, you couldn't call it a dialogue, but a sort of collective series of discussions. There was emailing, there was blogging, there was list serving and texting and tweeting. There was a cacophony of suggestions, noise if you like. You would have thought it was utter chaos. But, you know, there was also organization. And there even was an invisible hand at work in it all. That was the hand of John Palfrey. 
he had enormous deftness and diplomacy in dealing with this wide variety of people. And there was also Mora Marx, who was good at getting things done, doing them quietly, and making sure they happened and on time with this terrific Berkman team behind her. So you might say, you know, what, how should we think of the Digital Public Library of America? The answer, I believe, is it's not, don't imagine some magnificent edifice with a huge dome on top and a database underneath. No, the principle in this mission statement was it should be a horizontal kind of organization, not something that would be governed from the top down. It's something that would reach into the grassroots and involve everyone. In fact, it should be aimed at everyone, not just at college professors, but at a very broad public or series of publics, including K through 12 through PhD, but also old folks in retirement homes and individuals doing research for books or writing on anything, readers of all stripes who just wanted to deepen their enjoyment of li literature. So the mission was distributed, it was horizontal, it was broad, it was collective, and it worked. It worked largely because of the energy and the enthusiasm behind it. Uh, we had our, if you like, rhetorically excessive moments. There were times when we said, we will create the, li the new library of Alexandria, the library of libraries, the mother of all libraries. That rhetorical moment has passed. And we have moved now into a phase of what I would call pragmatism. Get the job done. Get down there with your head under the hood or wherever computer engineers put their heads and, and make sure that it actually happens and that it works. Well, on April 18th, when we went online, it did work. And it was consulted by, I think it's 3.5 pings per second or something like that. I mean, it was just astonishing. Uh, it functioned very well. So I think that what we could say about the character of the DPLA and about its origins is that it has been a collective enterprise of the sort that I think, if I may sound patriotic, makes this country great. We don't go to the government. This is a moment when the disgust with politicians in Washington is at its height, but it's also a moment when right here we can prove that we can get things done in the private sector by bringing together, in a way, these two elements, the idealism behind it and the pragmatic drive that makes it actually happen. So congratulations to everyone and welcome aboard to those who've just arrived. Thanks so much, Bob, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Bob, so much. Next up, we have Maura Marks, Deputy, Deputy Director of the Institute of Museum and Library Services, and as Bob just mentioned, one of the co-leaders of the Secretariat in the planning phase. Thank you, Dan. Hi, everybody. Um, the great thing about speaking at this point is in the evening is that much of what I was going to say has already been said, so my task is simplified. Um, I'm here also to say thank you to some of the people who made this happen, who made this great volunteer effort happen. And I'm going to thank, thank two large groups of people. So the first group that I'd like to thank is the Secretariat at the Berkman Center at Harvard. The Secretariat sounds very big and fancy. It was actually less people than half the fingers on this hand. Um, Rebecca Haycock and Kenny Whitebloom, please give them a huge round of applause. With honorary member steering committee chair John Palfrey, who was very much part of the secretariat and lent it his spirit, and the Berkman Center at Harvard, which is just the most brilliant, wonderful group of colleagues I've ever had the pleasure of working with, and they swelled the ranks of the secretariat always when needed, as they are doing tonight. So please join me in thanking them. Um, Dr. Urs Gasser, director of the Berkman Center, 
and then, so that I don't leave anyone out, Carrie Anderson, Amar Asher, Sebastian Diaz, Karen Glamo, Dan Jones, John Murley. I hope you're all waving and calling attention to yourselves because you deserve it. Caroline Nolan, David O'Brien, Ed Popko, Esther Simmons, and Becca Tabaski. Thank you for everything. You're awesome. Awesome, awesome. Now, you heard about how this volunteer effort did its work in work streams. The next group that I'd like to thank, I can't call out every name of every person who's been in a work stream, but I would like to recognize the steering committee and the chairs and conveners, the early adherents of uh, the work streams. And also, please indulge me, I'm gonna call your name. Come up here so that we can take a group photograph. So. <laughs> Audience, please hold applause till the end, or you can hoot and holler for certain people, I suppose. And I am, I can't help it, I'm a librarian. I'm going to call names in alphabetical order. If you are one of those people and I have left you out by some horrible oversight, please come along so that we can recognize you. So here goes. Susan Chun, Michael Colford, Ginny Cooper, you should all be coming down here. Paul Curran, I think he's not here tonight. Jill Cousins, is Jill here? Tomorrow, okay, she was gonna get the award for coming the farthest from, the Am from Amsterdam. Anyway, Bradley Daigle, Robin Dale, Bob Darton, Kim Doolin, Chris Freeland, Rachel Frick, Martin Gomez, Emily Gore, Dave Hansen, Nate Hill, Martin Kalfatovic, S.J. Klein, Jeffrey Licht, Deanna Markham, saw her over there, Dwight McInvale, Robert Miller, David O'Brien, John Palfrey, Francis Pinter, who gets the award coming from London, Amy Ryan, our wonderful host, Tom Sandville, James Shulman, Maureen Sullivan, Jill Vermillion, Doran Weber, David Weinberger, and Jeremy York. Come on down, everyone. You're supposed to get the picture taken. Round of applause. You should be over there. You should be in the picture. Picture. Two more very, very quick things. I would be remiss if I did not convey the greetings of my boss, Susan Hildreth, the director of the Institute of Museum and Library Services. We support great work all over the country. And she was a steering committee member early on and is a wonderful supporter of this project. She sends her greetings from Washington. And finally, before I pass the microphone to John Palfrey, I have to say, you know, again, it's been said, but John's leadership in this project, his wisdom, his brilliance, his humility, his kindness, his humor, all of it. I know he's giving me the stop it, but it's true. Most awesome colleague ever and um, a huge champion of this project. Over to you, John. I think Moira gets the prize for the best shoes at the event as well. <laughs> this is a great day, and thank you so much for all being part of this wonderful celebration. I think most of what I've said, wanted to say has already been said, so I will be super brief. Um, much of it, I think, is in line with the spirit of what Bob Darton said. It's so easy right now to be down on our democracy and down on the system that we are living and, um, and I think suffering through in a way. Um, but I think that the spirit that has brought the DPLA to fruition is one of those bright spots that really shows truly what engaged citizens can do in America and around the world as we have international partners. And what better place to do it than in Amy Ryan's house, free to all, you know, this amazing, amazing spot. And I want to say a few thank yous, but ultimately, I think the most exciting thing about where we stand right now is what we haven't yet seen of the Digital Public Library of America. The fact that what we have is a tiny, tiny starting point, something that has brought thousands of people into a process, but which is really the sense of the imagination of what we might be able to accomplish for and with the American people here to come. So I hope that everybody goes charging out of this room today and tomorrow just thinking about how can we be a part of making this even greater, making this something that over time is something we can be enormously proud of. As I've reflected on this project, I've thought often of a book called The Meaning of Everything. Have you read this book by Simon Winchester, The Making of the Oxford English Dictionary? And if you read this book, 
you remember that it starts in the 19th century and it's about a relatively small group of people thinking that they ought to make this wonderful big dictionary. And it starts out, it's sort of a private sector thing and it gets other people involved. But of course the point is that they think it might take you know, a few years and they think maybe one publisher will support it and that'll all be good. And then it goes into its next decade and then it goes into multiple decades in the second century. And people are still making the Oxford English Dictionary. And I've often thought that that's sort of the process that we're engaged in here, that we have this crazy big idea and a whole lot of people who think it's a good idea and a handful of people who have been willing to pay for it and in fact to do it and special thanks to Peter Baldwin for making the trip and Doran Weber uh, and others who have supported this. This is I think an amazing, amazing story of a public-private partnership in this way but I think we have centuries to go on this project honestly and that's to me sort of an awe-inspiring thing that people may be standing here sometime way after we're all gone thinking about what has been created and what we still could create. And that to me is what's so exciting about this project and what we can do for kids and others um, through this process. Um, I too wanted to torture you with a few thank yous, but I thought it actually really important to do. Um, there, there are in the course, I think, of the planning process, um, no mothers and fathers. And I think this is something so beautifully said by Bob, that this is something that came out of lots of people's collective will to do good in the world and to volunteer and make it happen. But I really think that there are a small handful of people who need a particular thank you um, as we draw almost to a close. And I think Dan is going to have the final words up here. Um, in getting this baton from an idea through to the extraordinary people led uh, by Dan and Emily uh, and Amy, um, who are uh, taken on this, this uh, particular job, and Kenny Whitebloom uh, and Frankie, who are the original five. Um, there really have been, woo, good, here's to the staff. This is a good crew. Thank you, guys. Um, there really are, I think, four people who have had the, um, the key hands on that baton, um, and, and uh, three of the four have already spoken, but um, I think, Doran, as a, um, an unusual statement, um, you have stood with us from the very beginning of this process and not just gone to the well as a vice president of foundation, but you have done intellectual work at our side in every major meeting and in every phone call and in every possible uh, intellectual setting. You have been there as a full and thoughtful partner and for that we are deeply, deeply grateful. Doran, thank you. I think many foundations say that they want to be a thought partner as well as just providing the cash, and I think, Doran, you have proved it and your colleagues at Sloan. Um, and Bob Darton, I think that you uh, never get enough credit for anything. Um, I think this is a process that, um, of course, we are all in many ways in your debt, but I want to thank you not just for your inspiration and your writing in the New York Review of Books, um, but really for your friendship to many of us and your mentorship for those of us who are young academics and looking up to someone who has gotten every major honor in the field, um, someone who could be resting on so many laurels that you have collected. Um, you two have been in there in the trenches with us, and I know you don't agree with exactly every decision we've made, nor have we necessarily always had exactly the same vision, but you have been in there with new ideas and fresh perspective and honestly such a kind heart and a way to bring us all along um, in this process. Thank you for that kindness. And we've thanked the Berkman team uh, many times, and we need to keep doing it. Um, there, is, there, there are two people in the Secretariat who really put lots of aspects of their lives on hold. This project came up, and they were fully committed to doing other things. Um, and they, I think, took the excitement of this project and have run with it in such an extraordinary way. Um, the person who I think many of you have heard from so many times during this process is Rebecca Haycock back there. She's known as the bomb, and she really <laughs> devoted herself so fully to this. Rebecca, thank you. And the biggest thank you of all I think we all owe is to the woman who really put her professional life on hold completely to do this. She had, was executive director of another institution, the Open Knowledge Commons, and Maura just held up her hand and said, yes, I am going to do this, and I am going to bring everybody together. This has been, I think, um, really uh, something that is as much your legacy, Maura, as anyone else in the room. And even though we resist the mothers and fathers thing, you really have been just absolutely the heart and soul of this project. We're so delighted at your new role as deputy director, as a Fed. Um, but Maura, this project, I think, is absolutely, completely in your image. So bless you. Maura Marks. <laughs> Thank you.
before I turn it over to Dan for final remarks, I just want to say, as we look at this long process ahead of us, I hope that tonight stands as an invitation, as much as it is a celebration. And I apologize for all of the thank yous, but we really had to do it after two and a half years of, this, of work that people put in. But really, this event and tomorrow, ultimately, I hope is a, just a huge invitation to say, please come be the next wave. This is a project that is going to need the leaders and volunteers who have the next set of ideas and will build on this platform and will build on all this energy. So I hope that when we, in two and a half or three years, come back, maybe right here, Amy, if you'll have us back, or perhaps somewhere on the West Coast or somewhere else, Chicago in the middle, who knows, um, that we will have a completely different set of people up on the stand. Maybe, Dan, I hope you and the staff are still <laughs> doing it. But I completely, completely hope that many of you, and whether you work at the Library of Congress or you work at other institutions, will raise your hand uh, and jump right in and be, um, be the next generation of leaders. I'm very, very eager to hand off the baton um, to all of you as well. So thank you. I appreciate it very much. Thanks so much, Sean. Well, as you can tell, I'm very, very lucky to have John Palfrey as the president of the board of the DPLA. So thank you, John. Thanks to everyone. Um, John mentioned very quickly just the names of the people who are actually doing the work right now um, upstairs at the DPLA. And I just want to highlight them so that you can see them, know that they've been working really hard. I mean, seven days a week to get to that five million and to work with all of our partners across the nation. Um, so before I get to our announcements, just very quickly, I'm going to put the spotlight on our staff. Um, over here, we have Emily Gore, our director of content. And next to her is Amy Rudersdorf, who's our assistant director of content. I think in the back, Kenny Whitebloom, our project coordinator, is getting fingers pointed at him. And the newest member of our team is Frankie Abbott, who is our project manager. Frankie. OK, over there. Yes, there she is. She's waving. So these are the people who are doing the work. And we have got so much work ahead. I'm so glad that everyone who came up here talked about some of the exciting things in the future, really. Because this is about the future now and what we're going to do over the coming years. We do have some incredible announcements for tonight to end the evening. Um, new things that are happening that we're excited about that really will snowball over the next few years into really incredible new directions. I mentioned earlier about our hubs. The hubs really are at the center of what we do. They are part of our network model. Tonight, we're announcing three new great hubs in three important states. All of them are important, but these are great states. States of New York, the Empire State Digital Network, a collaboration of a bunch of institutions. All right, New York. I'm a Red Sox fan, but I'll say thank you to the New York Hub for joining us. North Carolina is joining us as well. North Carolina Digital Heritage Center. And a country unto itself, Texas, the Lone Star State, a por portal to Texas history, are also joining the Hubs Network tonight, which is really great. Millions of items coming in from these, two, these three great states. And tomorrow, Emily and Amy will be running a workshop on how to become a hub, and if you're here from another state that's not represented, we would love to hear from you to join us again as this snowballs towards something bigger. We're also continuing to prog uh, make progress on adding new items and interfaces, and I think if you walk around the room, and I encourage you to do so after I'm done, to see some of the experiments that are going on with interfaces. We really loved one of them that related to books. It was David Weinberger and his team that um, started a project called Stack Life, and we have borrowed it from them <laughs> to help us with a new books initiative. And so tonight we launched DPLA Bookshelf. It's live now on the website. You know you can browse by maps and timeline, um, but now you can browse um, in this great serendipitous way through our bookshelf, choosing an item, a book off the shelf. The books are sized appropriately to what they'd look like on the shelf. And you even get images that relate to, uh, to that book from our larger collection. So that's live on the site now, DPLA Bookshelf. Yes, thank you. We have really critical new funding um, to announce tonight. We're announcing a million dollar grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I believe Program Officer Chris Joasis is in the audience over here. Thanks, Chris. 
We're really excited for this alliance with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and we're going to be working with them to set up training, digital training, for public librarians across the nation in a pilot phase so that we can work with them to build better local collections, better digitized local collections, and to collaborate with us and our hubs to help make a better whole in that network way that John talked about. So thank you to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We're really excited about this announcement. Finally, it is, it's a great time to get involved. I'm so glad John mentioned this. It is the best time to get involved. Um, we have so much going on. We need so much help to carry out this mission. And we're announcing a couple of ways tonight, and we'll elaborate on one of them tomorrow, for everyone to get involved. One of them is around resources. We are launching dp.la slash donate. You can go there right now. Um, we have a set of uh, wonderful prizes <laughs> and swag for you to get, um, including beautiful t-shirts, uh, water bottles for individual donors starting at just $2 a month um, up to whatever you would like to donate to the cause can make a huge difference. And we also have institutional, organizational, and corporate sponsorship levels that are live on the site at dp.la slash donate. I encourage everyone to go to that table after I'm done and start your sponsorship of the DPLA. I mentioned that we are people and we want, there's only five of us, as you probably noticed, and we're working really, really hard at the DPLA, but we could use some help. So we are launching tonight the Community Reps Program, also live right now on our website, dp.la slash reps. And this is an opportunity for those who have been involved or who would like to be involved more to get involved with us as local representatives of the DPLA, help us evangelize, help us get out the word to all those local communities that we can't get to, to tell them about the DPLA, to help local schools and libraries to use the DPLA, to get involved in many other ways, through Hackfest, events. Um, we would love to see hundreds of members of the Community Reps Program. There's a short application. SATs aren't required. Um, but if you go to dp.la slash reps, it's a great way for those of you who are involved perhaps in the planning phase or want to get involved now to become a part really of DPLA along with the five of us in the central office. So we are really excited about these opportunities that we see here tonight. Finally, um, I want to encourage you um, to uh, Take advantage of the space we're in and to, to get the vibe of the Boston Public Library. There are tours that I believe are going to be leaving from the room out in the back here to my right, your left, um, that will be leaving to tour this really glorious building. Um, and to get excited about a really energetic and full day tomorrow with workshops with so many volunteers. We had dozens of volunteers step forward to run these workshops. We're going to have hundreds and hundreds of people at Northeastern and Simmons tomorrow, get there bright and early to get a seat. Um, and so we look forward to sharing DPLA Fest, our first annual DPLS, DPLA Fest with you tomorrow and indeed in the coming days and months and years to build the Digital Public Library of America. Thank you so much for joining us.